All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. We are here with the one and only Clark Quinn. Hey, Clark. Hey, folks. Uh, you also may know him <laughs> as the Quinnovator. <laughs> I know that's a term you like to use. I very witty. Um, but but I imagine, yeah, there are a lot of Clark fans here. Um, I, I know there was a lot of excitement about this session because Clark has been in the field doing great work for a long time, decades now. This is like, yeah, I've built up a very big body of work. You've been working in like educational games and, and learning science and human computer inter interaction since like the 80s, right? Uh, slightly before that, but yes. Slightly before <laughs> that. So. so you've seen it all. Yeah, as an undergrad. As an undergrad, nice. There was some relevant work. <laughs> so yeah, you've, you've seen how we've gotten to where we are today and you have some good thoughts on that. I've been following your posts on LinkedIn, which are very insightful. I think when I first came across your name, I was a master's student and I saw the, the serious e-learning manifesto. That's what it is, right? I hope I didn't, the serious mm. learning manifesto. I think it's all about e-learning. Serious e-learning manifesto. Right. So that was great. As someone who was so passionate and interested in e-learning, that manifesto was like, yes, these are all these are all the right things to keep an eye out for. So if anyone hasn't come across that, it's a very good good thing to read, print out, post on your wall, <laughs> keep it with you at all times. <laughs> but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We are here to talk about Clark's most recent book. And is this number number six or number seven? I don't know if you've updated your LinkedIn profile. Uh, number seven, actually. Number seven. Okay. So this is book number seven. And this one is all about engagement and some evidence-backed principles behind engagement. Because we hear about it all the time, right? Design engaging e-learning, you know, make, make this more engaging. <laughs> and I, and that, <laughs> that has come to mean some things that probably aren't actually benefiting the, the audience. So, so we're gonna explore some principles from Clark's book. Um, I read it a couple of weeks ago right after it came out. You can get it uh, as an ebook for like $11, I think it is. So I'll share a link with you all to that later. But definitely a worthwhile read if you are working in the learning field, which all of us are. Okay, cool. There's that link to the e-learning manifesto. Go ahead and bookmark that. Save it to read after this session. But, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll try to answer your questions if you have some good, good relevant questions as we, we go. We'll try to keep an eye on the chat. And I have some questions as well to kind of bring us into this. So my, my first question for you, I tried my best to set the context for everyone, but how does this concept of engagement and this latest book, how does that fit into your career long mission to really support and revolutionize, revolutionize this, this field? Well, it, it's, I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate. So that's why even before the eighties <laughs> and uh, I ended up designing my own major because we didn't have one. So it has been my career ever since. But my first job after that program was designing and programming educational computer games. And, you know, I joined a company that was doing that and got involved and helped push us into the home market. And I realized that there was this potential way to get ex people extremely engaged. So uh, I was playing the original Colossal Cave Adventure game and realizing we could build much deeper learning into these environments. And my uh, boss at the time agreed. He said, yes, I think that's true, but I don't know that I can sell it. And I said, I don't want to worry if I can sell it. I went back to get a PhD in what was effectively applied cognitive science. It was cognitive psych, but my advisor was at that time, the, the lab was looking at human computer interaction and I ended up uh, did a postdoc on learning, ended up teaching that, doing research, a lot of stuff. But games have been a recurrent theme. So I did a game based on my PhD research. And then when I got to the university, I was asked by uh, a colleague, you do games, you know, and I got involved with his project. And then I was asked to do a project for the Children's Welfare Agency and we created a game. And I just, that last one, led me to reflect, you know, as an academic, what I was supposed to do was write research papers, right? And so I wrote a paper based upon that game and I found this alignment that ended up being the basis of my first book, which was How Do You Design Serious Games? And subsequent, and this book, to make it meaningful, I resurrect that alignment to show that learning can and should be hard fun, but it's how do we, it, it's been a recurring theme of my career. You're asking how did, you know, how does it fit with my lifelong mission? My lifelong mission is to take what we know about learning 
and apply that to the design of instructional solutions, right? The learning technology solutions. And it's just become clear that ignoring the emotional component is a big mistake because we find that we learn better when we're opened up emotionally as well as cognitively with a caveat. You brought up an interesting point. When I mentioned this latest book, my colleague Charles Jennings said, do not title it, don't put engagement in the title. And I said, why? And he said, because it's become trivialized. You know, click to see more, isn't that more engaging? Let's add points and, and scores yeah. and that'll be more engaging. And all that stuff isn't really what helps sometimes in small amounts, but it tends to dissipate really quickly. We can and need to do more and better. Great. I see. And and that's where you're going to, some of what you're going to share with us today. So we're in the right place if, <laughs> if you want to learn more about that. Yeah, I've, I've been talking about this session as it's going to be about engagement. But I remember, yeah, the title of the book is Make It Meaningful. And then that subtitle, Take Learning from Instructional to Transformational. So that's the full title of the new book. I'll share a link with you all, but but I could see why you'd be wary to include engagement in the title because it's like, oh, another book about adding, you know, adding more interactions or whatever it is. So, yeah, that is what a lot of potential clients and stuff I've found mean when they say make it more engaging, just add more bells and whistles. So uh, you're going to gamification and there's a very narrow sense that that's appropriate and a very broad sense in which it's not yeah. <laughs> so okay so uh, so this is how you start your book and i i wanted to kind of set the scene with this next question what's the typical reaction to company mandated learning experiences and maybe we're all familiar with this but you know imagine imagine we're we're sitting here now through one of these engaging <laughs> gamified all the bells and whistles e-learning experiences Um, I think the experience is people avoid it if they can. There have even been stories of um, kid people paying their kids to click through any required yeah. e-learning. Um, it's like, oh, no, we have really undermined our credibility with what we've delivered. Sure, there are some really stellar examples. There are some simulations and use of VR that's not trivial but, but deep. But by and large, too often, we see bullet points jazzed up with animations and characters. Um, and it turns out from a learning science perspective, that stuff actually interferes. Uh, we had an interview yesterday with Rich Mayer uh, on the learning development accelerators you ought to know. And he his research points out how all that gratuitous eye candy adds extra cognitive load, which then reduces the amount available to do the instructional processing, let alone that we don't tend to have people do meaningful tasks. I was just responding to an email this morning about somebody whose subject matter experts and instructional designers are just fine with awareness educate, you know, learning. Oh, well, we just, if they're aware of it, there's some belief that if people are aware of it, they'll change their behavior which we know is not true. Yeah. <laughs> We're not these formal logical reasoning beings. Even if we believe and commit to changing, we'll backslide if we are not, you know, haven't had a properly developed experience that supports us in changing our behavior significantly. Yeah. That sounds like an interesting interview. Uh, and that's in, that's in the Learning <laughs> and Development Accelerator. That's the um, like professional development uh, community that you help support and you interview these leading people in the field the people you ought to know yeah. <laughs> that's why it's titled that section yeah oh. uh, LDA <laughs> is a is a society for evident people who are interested in evidence-based approaches to learning and development nice. that, yeah that's a great angle to be taking um, in the current <laughs> climate uh, because it could help us yeah move against that that reaction to these company mandated learning experiences um, and a whole bunch of other myths that people, you know, uh, either actively promote or implicitly follow that aren't really evidence based. So, um, you know, uh, indeed, the boring required company course, but, you know, personality assessments, learning styles, generational myths, a whole bunch of other stuff that we see in practice that the evidence suggests no don't 
Yeah, and I know I know you wrote an entire an entire book on that as well. These these common misconceptions in training. So so yeah, you've been hard at work at working against this. Uh, and I, I know the people who are here are clearly passionate about designing these evidence based evidence backed learning experiences and improving their craft. I know people here aren't doing these um, probably aren't doing a lot of these like more information dump style e learning except for when they have to. <laughs> but some of the names I'm seeing, I know you all are doing some really interesting work. Um, Jesse loves the Learning and Development Accelerator and um, is curious about your thoughts on DEI awareness training. Yeah, I saw that in the chat. Um, I don't a big believer in awareness training. Being aware of DEI doesn't necessarily change people's behaviors. What you want, what people need is to be able to recognize it when it's happening and know what to do and have practice doing it so they feel confident that if they see it, they actually will do it. Um, I recently went through some uh, on behalf of my client. You know, they say, oh, well, you're a contractor, you got to follow this stuff. And they were pointing out to triggers and various scales of escalation. If somebody's really a, you know bullying and is you don't want to risk your personal safety, what can you do? Can you help de-escalate it? Can you just stay away and report it because it's too dangerous for you? But we need to do more than just awareness. And I, are the compliance courses that organizations have, most of them are, you know, just cover your asset because the um, you know, lawyers have said, well, if, you, we did, if we have this, if somebody exhibits this behavior and we've offered a course on it, we can claim that they're just a bad person. And Mark Rosenberg once said in the column for Learning Solutions that one of these days, somebody accused is gonna come back and push back and say, you offered me that course, but it didn't give me any effective skills. And so I'm not guilty, you're guilty for not really teaching me how to avoid it. And I think that's going to be right. Um, so I think, and you know, of course, there's all these stupid requirements. We measure it in terms of seat time instead of any competency-based thing that says demonstrate you can now do this in an appropriate context. So there's a lot of things wrong with what we're doing. And yet, if we cared, if people really wanted to solve these problems, they could design effective solutions. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I'm sure we can all relate to that frustration. I know we felt it. You've probably been feeling, yeah, you've been feeling it. I don't, I don't know. Like, as your sense that since corporate learning and development has been a thing that we've been kind of facing these problems and things have been measured in this way, or, yeah. well, part of it's mandated, right? So the government says you have to spend an hour a year on X, Y, and Z right. if you're a government contractor do any government support of work in certain laws, which is just you know lawmakers either being influenced or not know, knowing enough about how learning works. And that's actually a real problem because a lot of our problems stem from our stakeholders having been to school and therefore thinking they know what education looks like. And yet the relationship between school and learning is relatively faint, I'm uh, sad to say. Um, and um, so, but there are a lot of factors that have led to this. This includes, you know, the rise of, well, particularly after 911, nobody wanted to travel. So there was a big push to take training and put it online. And they said, and, you know, for naive reasons, including believing as long as it looks like school, it must be learning. They got rapid e-learning tools, it allowed you to take PowerPoints and PDFs that, you know, were used to be the resources and you put it up online and add a quiz and you have e-learning. And we've gotten to the point where people expect you can develop a meaningful course in a couple of weeks on your own with just a tool and a bunch of PowerPoints and PDFs, which is ludicrous. Yeah. But we've allowed ourselves to be led into this. And we, you know, there are a bunch of other reasons include, you know, people ending up being accidental instructional designers, as Cami Bean's very good book, uh, very big indictment of our industry, suggests that, you know, just because you were good at the job doesn't mean you're going to be a good trainer. And just because you actually got, you know, people liked your training doesn't mean it was effective. And just because you were uh, a trainer that people liked, you can then create online learning. All of this causal reasoning that leads us to this place where we're at has flaws all along the way. Yeah. So, 
Um, and I see we also have another question in the chat from Marie Noel. Yeah, and um, I think I, I might be leading us there, like right after this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess before we should dive into that that specific question, Marie Noel, we should we should talk about what we even mean when we talk about engagement. We're saying what engagement isn't, but what do we mean when we talk about making something more engaging or designing an engaging learning experience? Right. Um, I think there's a, a couple components to that. The, and I break it up into two, well, I break it up into two components and I use a fishing more metaphor and I'm not a fisher person, so I can't state for, don't think that this is necessarily a great metaphor, but I believe there's, you got to hook them first. You've got to get them willing to commit the effort in the learning experience. And then during the learning experience, you have to maintain that commitment. So to hook them first, I believe you have to open up people emotionally even before you open them up cognitively. From learning science, we know that when you activate relevant knowledge before you provide new knowledge, it's going to stick better. Granted, absolutely. But we also have to help people understand why they should care. And we ignore that too much. Too often we see, you know, we just start launching the course. Here's the objectives we're going to achieve. And here's the information. It's like, why should I care? We need to do that. We need to help people understand that viscerally that, oh, you know, I do need this. Uh, and then, you know, once we've hooked them, there's three parts to the hook in my mind. You know, I do need this also and i don't know it now um, because sometimes people, you know i need this but i know it and sometimes you know that cannot be true and yet they believe it's true and so you have to may have to address that with certain audiences and then the third thing is and i believe this uh experience will change that mm. now we've lost a lot of credibility so we may have to work extra hard on that third one as well to say look we know we finally we, we've seen the light we've we now have a better idea what to do. Give us a chance, right? So that's the hook. Okay. And then once there, you have to deliver on that. You have to say, yes, we're going to be giving you. We're going to be giving you meaningful practice that is compelling in that you're solving problems you get are real. They're related to the work and you care about them. And they're at the right level of challenge. Um, they're set in a context. We know that, you know, from learning science reason, contexts are better, but contexts are also more engaging than abstract problems. In fact, we shouldn't be what we do to our kids in school, giving them abstract math problems, just horrible, evil things. <laughs> Not evil, but just naive, I guess. Um, so I would suggest that, you know, and there's a whole bunch that goes into what makes a compelling experience, including, you know, we need models. How do we make them as minimal as possible and useful? The examples, how do we make them as relevant as possible? Practice is the really critical element that's going to make the difference. We There's a lot of nuances around that and heuristics and tips and tricks we can use. But we need to get both of these right. We need to help the learner go, you know, I do need this. And trusting that the experience will change that. And then we need to actually make that experience the most effective and most engaging experience it can be as so that we they come out going well wow, i am transformed i had an experience and i came out and i am equipped with new skills that's okay the goal. okay so this was there's a lot of good stuff in here i'm sure some people were taking notes but maybe maybe i could try to do a quick recap so the first piece we want to hook them and the hook as you see is made up of these three key parts or or we need we need our audience to believe three key things need them to believe that they need they need this they need to learn this um they need to learn it now not in a year from now <laughs> and they believe that this experience or this thing you're presenting them is going to help them get where they're trying to go so that's that's important i mean i'm, I'm i was thinking about like the arcs model of like motivation when you were when you were speaking about the hook and yeah those first two pieces attention and relevance how are we getting their attention how are we showing them how this is relevant to them um so i could see how that that's very much in alignment with that. And then once we have them hooked, what is your, how do you carry the metaphor forward? You, what do you like reel them in? Is that the metaphor? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. The second part, yeah, we've hooked okay. them, but now we got to land them. <laughs> now you got to land them, <laughs> um, right, okay. Right. And to do that. And, and that's a much longer process. You know, you got to 
reel them in and let them run and reel them in and let them run. And you have that, you know, in dramatic senses, you have that t dramatic tension uh, escalation and you accomplish that through the appropriate level of challenges. You develop their abilities yeah. and more. So, so, the, so challenges and practice, um, we're all probably very familiar with that. I mean, it seems in alignment with like Kathy Moore and a lot of us, a lot of the people here are probably Kathy Moore fans. She's been on the channel a few times. So yeah, you, yeah, practice is key. Um, and it's up to us to design these challenging experiences that are also, yeah, that also account for that emotional element, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, Kathy Moore's tapping into this and, you know, in a very heuristic and appropriate way. She says, what do they need to be able to do? And what's the minimum we can do to get them there? Absolutely. I, a lot of people believe you have to absolutely train them for the task. I believe sometimes the further the more, uh, transfer you need. So you're not just learning to use this device, but you're learning to deal with a broader variety of people. Put setting in a fantastic setting, and I've checked with Carl Kapp about this as well, um, just to validate, you know, that I wasn't alone in this belief that there's some research grounding for it, that there are times when setting it in a fantastic setting makes sense. But even before that, exaggerating it so the circumstances aren't, you're just saving another patient, you're saving, you know, the daughter of the ambassador or something. Just that le one level of exaggeration that helps. So yes, um, and I'm glad you, you know, I like Keller's ARCS model and I, I reference in there. The sad thing is he's about the only ID theorist who does talk about this stuff at all, the emotional yeah. side of the equation. And that's, yeah, it's really good that he did. I just wish it was more reflected in the rest of what a lot of people learn about. Yeah, and I love that you brought up that point because that was one of my like biggest takeaways from your book is about um, the setting, like where to set these scenarios. So, uh, and I and I love the distinction on how to how to make that call. I don't know if that's like too nerdy to get into here, or if we're gonna lose people, <laughs> but or, um, but but maybe we should maybe we should just dive into it. So it's about yeah, how do you decide? Okay, so so if we're we were a doctor, we need to speak to our patients. Yeah, how do we or what about something with like a fantasy land? I don't know. Maybe we're like we're training detectives. <laughs> do we train them how to solve a crime scene like in their in the city that they're working in, or do we or do we give them the opportunity to solve a crime scene that happened in like outer space, for example, or some some setting they would never be in? And I think the distinction. Right. Or do you want to explain how to how to make that call or when one may be appropriate? It, mm -hmm. Um. I can't say that there are any principles. Um, well, no, there are principles, or, but actually they're more heuristics than algorithms. We can't guarantee. Because people are more complex than concrete, you know, we can factor and figure out the right concrete to pour for a pier because its properties are set, but people are, are different. So I did set project management training in outer space. Um, these these engineers, what they did was engineered large projects like freeway interchanges and things, about as big a thing as people do. So it wasn't that big an exaggeration. Take it one up level further in terraforming planets. And it also meshed for a variety of reasons. There's a number of constraints that you want to satisfy. It so happened that the client I was doing this for, for their client, happened to have great skills at um, alien plants. They'd written a book about the flora of a uh, fauna of a particular Star Wars planet. I mean, <laughs> they, so they had graphic design skills that matched doing outer space things. So, so it was, and engineers, you know, uh, were more likely to be attracted to space, et cetera, et cetera. You should, you know, understand your audiences, not just what they know, but now what they're interested in. And you need to find out what makes this particularly interesting in, in relationship to, to Jesse's question about compliance training? Why is this important? And when you talk to your experts, among the things that you need from them, you need the models that guide performance, you need the misconceptions people regularly make, you need the stories of great wins and losses, but there's something else. And I learned about this in a situation where a colleague had come to me and said, we're doing a game, would you like to help? And I said, sure, what's it about? And he said, computer auditing. You know, and I, you know, I said, I think I'd rather have my teeth pulled without anesthesia or something along those lines. And he said, yes, that's what I thought too. But then I talked to them and they said, it's like playing detective per your point, comment on detective. You work your way back. Most of the times it's just an error, but sometimes it's deliberate. And they had the story right there. 
and the point being that to the people who do it, your experts have spent years, possibly decades, becoming passionate, you know, finding this so interesting. Unpack that, find out what makes it a little bit, you know, below the surface of you know, making the world a better place. No, what is it about this thing that's intrinsically interesting? And similarly with compliance, there's a reason they had to create that training. Somebody messed up, it cost somebody money, it cost somebody's lives, it cost something. Find out what the, the consequences of that were and make that manifest. Make that clear to people that, whoa, this is important because if we don't do it, and if you pull this out, you get these hooks that you can then leverage for that initial hook and for building into your practices. You, your practices, you're gonna get some ideas. You, you wanna be creative and systematic creativity isn't an oxymoron. <laughs> there are ways to be um, systematic in you know brainstorming and and how to do that properly so you need to think about it get everybody to think about it individually and then come together and share the ideas that's how you get the best and then you're going to possibly try several things well let's run this by people let's run this by people get some feedback fine-tune it but do push further than you think you'll get away with because if you just already limit yourself to what you think you'll get away with, they'll still push back and you'll get even more limited mm -hmm. and boring. So push it beyond what you think and force them to push you back. Your learners will thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And good, good takeaway there. Like what are the consequences if we don't do this? Like exploring those confident consequences and those stories about what, what led us here, what led us to needing this. That seems like a rich source of material. Mm -hmm. um, about Absolutely. It about deciding on that, that context piece, I just wanted to comment on that before we look at the chat for questions. Um, I think before reading this book, I thought, yeah, the closer we can get to the performance context, the better. The closer these simulations we're designing match that, the, the better it is. But I think the, a point you made in the book is that if the people doing the performance, if they have to do it in all of these, like, in these contexts that vary widely, instead of mirroring one of those specific contexts if we do something that is like more fantastical or more set out there that's going to make it easier for them to transfer to a variety of different contexts that's like the nerdy point that i got kind of excited about <laughs> um it's like oh wait so yeah there are cases where it does it is, it is a better case for learning to to set things in this like fantastical setting so mm -hmm. yes you still want to facilitate the reflection you want to facilitate that abstraction if people do problems in a whole bunch of different contexts they don't necessarily see the links that make them all as instances of the same idea mm -hmm. we know from research on cognitive my own phd uh was on analogical reasoning and we know that people are good at using analogies but they're bad at generating them so facilitate them seeing those connections but in a fantastic setting, it may be, e you know, it's the evidence suggests that it is indeed easier for people to transfer, but you still want to give a breadth of experience. So, and you can do this in a couple ways. So your de detective in space could work for a specific detective, you know, for a particular police department and only that, or they could be a consulting detective and actually jump over to this planet and this planet. There are ways to get you facing different situations and that depends on how far a transfer you yeah um, but yes um and sorry yes i love geeking out about this so <laughs> yeah. don't at all worry about asking me geeky questions i just hope with the audience is okay <laughs> yeah um yeah a little geeky but hopefully that was interesting for some of you and and maybe it'll make more sense when you dive into the book but i was i was excited about that mm -hmm. so maybe we'll we'll try to catch up on some questions in the chat I see that a lot of them have come in. So um, if any if any stand out to you, do you wanna, or would you rather me just pick some? Um, well, I, I see one about the use of visual resources to trigger emotions. I only see generic stock images as investing worthy time creating visual triggers for each course. Um, I like Connie Malamed as a person I really like for talking about visual design. Um, I think you had her on uh, one of your last sessions. Last week actually. Interviews. Yeah, um, she does a good job of talking about a visual style guide. And, you know, you have an overall maybe corporate style guide, but then each experience should have its own theme and look and feel. And 
I do believe strong individuals, but if they're not relevant, they can, you know, I mentioned earlier about Rich Mayer and cognitive load, you know, John Sweller, um, too much extraneous can interfere. So you want to make sure they're on point, that they are either helping set the context in very subtle ways, or they're actually relevant to the specific task or the, the underlying model. We do want to tr trigger emotions carefully and don't assume you're going to get it right the first time. You're going to make your best stab. You should test it and tune it a little bit. Um, I think you can do a lot with stock images, but it, it has to be done appropriately. And a lot depends on your resources. If you have a visual design team, and some organizations do if they're big enough, draw upon that, get them involved, get them doing some of the visual design for you and be become their partners. It's good learning experience design is actually hard to do all alone. Um, as one of my colleagues once said, we, we were going and talking about games to, to our client. Um, we ran a workshop for him. He said, it's really hard to be a solo game designer, learning game designer, but it's true for experience as well, because one person is being really creative and it, you need that other person to figure out how we're actually going to make that happen. And so <laughs> you, it's hard to be the person who can do both of those. And I realize you can't always be working in teams because of real world constraints, but find those times when you should get together with several other people and do some brainstorming, and then you can go away and work on it and be willing to contribute to your other colleagues in the same way. Um, and so, you know, visual images are part of all the, the overall aesthetic. Can you use sound or is it going to be interfering because it's in an open plan office and if you're listening to it, it's disturbing the person next to you? How do you handle this? But even visuals are about evaluating the trade-offs and figuring out what's the benefit versus what's the cost. But be very clear on the cost of the cognitive load that it could be creating. Yeah, good points. Always a good consideration when it comes to adding something new. Is it going to be worth it? Does, does the benefit outweigh that cost? So. Yeah, relevance mm -hmm. seems like a good baseline thing to evaluate. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do you have... Um, oh, hi, Christy. <laughs> Be fully nerdy. Um, I just see Christy Tucker's joined in. Oh, hey, Christy. Uh, Thanks for joining us. He does great stuff with scenarios. So. Yes. yes, indeed. We actually spoke with Christy, but it was a while ago, like over a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, But thanks for joining us, Christy. And maybe we should just dive back into the engagement piece, go back up to that question from Marie Noel. Um, that's where I was going next too. Like, what do we actually need to change if we're trying to design more engaging learning experiences? And Marie Noel's question is about what are some strategies we can start implementing? Mm -hmm. um, well, the first place I'd focus is on practice. Yeah. Um, we don't do good practice. We do we tend to do knowledge test questions. And we can write good questions in multiple choice, but they should be mini scenarios. It should be a situation where you have a choice of actions to take as opposed to reciting knowledge, because that's what you're gonna have to do in the real world. I, my editorial soapbox is, I'm gonna suggest what's gonna make a difference to organizations is not the ability to better recite facts, but the ability to make better decisions. And that's, yeah. actually makes it easier to work with your subject matter experts because um, you they have enough uh, because of the way our cognitive architecture works with compile knowledge away they tend to recite the knowledge they have instead of their actual what they do in fact they can't even articulate what they do 70 percent of what they do isn't available consciously to them is the estimate from a group in in the university of southern california so but if you focus on the decisions people need to make differently, that's one way to break it out. So practice putting it in decisions, putting them in scenarios. You can do it in multiple choice questions. You can do it in branching scenarios. You can do it in full game environments, but get better, more and better practice. And, you know, to Kathy Moore's map, but make that the focus and put the minimum resources around to succeed at that. Then the second thing is to redo our intros to include that emotional hook to begin with. Um, Back to the practice, we need to make sure that the challenge is appropriate. How many, you know, I like to ask this of uh, audiences when I speak, how many of you have seen a quiz question where the alternatives to the right answer were so obvious or silly that you could have gotten the question right without having learned anything? Everybody 
raises their hand, right? That's just such a waste. Make sure the questions are challenging enough. It gives us a chance to identify when, you know, put the alternatives to the right answer to be the reliable misconceptions we see in practice, and you have a chance to address them before they make it a mistake out when it matters. So um, practice and hook are two of the places, the strategies I would focus on first. Um, and then, you know, and you always, after you get your performance objectives, not learning objectives, performance objectives, what do they need to be able to do? The next thing you design is your final practice, and then you design the practices, and then you design the examples and the models that guide that performance. Although the models play a role and help you determine what the appropriate practice is. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw <laughs> some other good questions, but um, well, good points. Yeah. It's, we obviously don't have enough time to go into a step by step of how to design <laughs> these experiences. But yeah, I think hmm. that, that nice heuristic of the, the hook and then how do we actually follow up on that? I think that's a good place to start for people. Um, I did see a question. Let's see. Let's In regards about... to testing emotional responses. There's so much variability and individuality when it comes to these responses. How can we determine what is acceptable and what isn't? That's the question from Jesse. Like, how can we, I guess the question right. is, how can we gauge this accurately when it may be so different for different people? Oh, the only appropriate way is to take blood samples and measure the adrenaline in the blood and then also measure galvanic skin response um, by putting clamps on people and measuring how much electricity is conducted when they're engaged. That's a lie. <laughs> I'm not serious at all. That's, you could do that, but it's way over the top. Frankly, subjective, you know, the engagement side is a subjective experience. You ask people, you know, afterwards, here's, you know, um, the Kirkpatrick's for all the flaws in the model. And somebody mentioned, I see uh, Jesse mentioned the LTEM model and Will Talheimer, I think, is does a great job. But I, the reason I like the Kirkpatrick model is it focuses, if you follow it properly, not go, oh, well, we're doing level one, we're doing the first part. No, no, no. You start at level four, work back to level three. So you start saying, what are the problems we need to solve? What would we need to change to be doing differently in the workplace? How do we make that happen? Do we need design learning? It would work for other interventions as well, performance support, incentive change, you know, has that led to the change of behavior? And cognitively, that first level, Asking people what they think of the experience is worthless. From a point of view of impact, the correlation between a novice's assessment of the value of a learning experience and its actual impact is zero, 0 0.09, which is zero with a rounding error. But their evaluation of subjective experience is what we're working on, what we care about. We want them to think that this is better than a you know, punch in the eye. <laughs> we want this them to think that this is better than their previous learning experiences. We want them to think that this was the best way to have acquired this ability. So, and you can ask them. And yes, there's variability, but when you get an aggregate, every, you know, and by the way, when you're doing your initial analysis, you should set your metrics. So you you can't do good learning experience design if you don't have good performance objectives, because you have no performance to align the experience to. It's just going to be an information dump. You need to say, what are people need to be able to do? And then let's make an experience that makes them do it. Let's make that a compelling experience. Let's ramp up the story around it, the context and, and the challenge so that we're going, oh, wow, I got to, I get that this is an important problem to solve. And I'm having, it's pitched at just the right difficulty. I'm doing hard fun. All that stuff's good. But you want to have goals for how will we know that they are now capable of doing it? You need to have performance metrics. You set that up front. And then at the end, you test. First, you test to get usability out of the way, because if people are making mistakes, and it's because of the interface, not because they're not getting it, you don't know. So get to usability problems, then test the effectiveness, and then test the engagement. And the right answer to when you should need to stop iterating on design is not when you run out of time and money. <laughs> that's the standard answer, but that's the wrong answer. The right answer is, when you've hit your goals. Now, if you're running out of time and money before you're getting close to your goals, consciously evaluate. Do I need more time and money because these goals are important or can I re reduce the, you know, these goals? But you're doing that consciously, not implicitly. And that's an important component. 
Okay, yeah, you're, touch, you're touching on some key themes repeatedly that I think people will walk away with. Um, yeah, uh, good places to start that, that practice. Um, Katie particularly struggles with background stories. Coming up with background stories, I, I may be for the experience as a whole, Katie, or for specific characters. Do you have any um, specific recommendations about that? Is it pull the stories um, from background stories? Um, well, the, the first thing is so part of the thing is how do you deal with SMEs? How do you deal with your subject matter experts? Like I said, you need models from. By the way, not every SME is good is a worthwhile SME. Um, having worked, uh, talked with people like Roger Shank uh, from Socratic Arts and uh, Norm Beer from Carnegie Mellon's uh, Open Learning Initiative, they reliably say not every SME is good. They, sometimes they're good at it, but they can't articulate it, or they have models, but they're not grounded in practice. I believe you need to triangulate. But then you work with your SMEs. In addition to the models and the decisions and the misconceptions, you want stories from them about great wins and losses. Now, they might not be willing to talk about their own mistakes. It's wonderful when they can, but they always can tell you stories about somebody else's mistakes, right? Those are where you pull those background stories. Now, you may weave your own stories around it. You may use tricks like exaggeration or setting, resetting it into a different um, fantasy. So instead of doing it in the workplace, you're doing it in a Wild West saloon, or you're doing it in an ancient medieval castle, or you're doing it in outer space. But you're, you know, the, there are things you can vary and things you can't. But you want to pull those stories from real wins and losses. That's the best place because then it's grounded in reality. And the story should tell you why it was a success or why it was a failure. And you bake that in as well. And that gives you some of the, you know, particularly the failures give you some of the misconceptions, the ways people typically go wrong. Um, so I really like uh, getting those stories. And sometimes you'll have to write them, you know, if you can. Uh, the reason you triangulate, by the way, not only SMEs, but supervisors can tell you errors about, you know, no, we send, they come out from training and they still do this stupid thing. You want to build that into your training. Um, and you get the novices and they'll go, you know, they taught me this, but this was the problem I faced in the workplace. That you want to build and trying. And that's why you want not just subject matter experts, you need to triangulate on the information that is going to end up being the critical out, uh, focus of your performance objectives and therefore your practice and therefore your learning experience. It seems like a lot of this comes back to talking to the people, talk to your subject matter experts, talk to, talk to the client you're working with, talk to the audience that you're serving um before during and yeah. after the this design and mm -hmm. development process it sounds like yes and you have to you absolutely want to do that but you also want to make sure that you're getting these particular pieces of information that will are critical to making a learning experience that actually is not only engaging but is also effective yes so you need these certain elements you get it by going around talking to people um there's good reason to believe that actually bringing them together and having them interact to create a shared understanding is really valuable because they come in with different perspectives. And if you can properly facilitate that process, the outcome is a really rich understanding and replete with stories and models and misconceptions that you can tap into. So, um, uh, and I think you even equated those two in in this latest book, right? You're like engaging, like the engaging and the effective piece. Like if, if it's effective, it's engaging. If it's engaging, it's effective. <laughs> Was it that clear cut? Well, it, it's not that clear right. cut. It can be engaging and not be effective. It can be effective and not be engaging. But ideally, to me, learning experience science is the elegant integration of those both. Right. So my previous book was Learning Science. So I kind of wrote this as a complement to that. I do touch on the play, you know, some of the elements that essentially I tried to bring out all the elements about the learning science, or at least refer to them and say, you know, but I wasn't going to cover them in depth because I've already done that. Um, and so this is really for people who have the learning science in some way or understand it or will 
study that and complement this is how to take it to the next level right um, good distinction okay i see we have a couple more questions we have one from carmen about what learning situations would benefit from the incorporation of gamification elements I'm, i know you i'm sure you'll have something to say about <laughs> gamification <laughs> elements and well and it really carmen your question is what do you mean by gamification elements? Um, points and scores, uh, to me, are a matter of last resort. Uh, I remember Clark Aldrich telling this story. So he was a Gartner analyst who saw that games were truly simulations and games were truly the vision for the future of learning. And he went out and left Gartner and created a company and they created a leadership training thing. And he had had to admit that he wanted to keep tuning it to get this engagement in his investors said, no, you've got to put it out on the market. So he ended up putting in scores just because he didn't have time to tune it where he wanted to. Um, once you've got the intrinsic motivation right, if you still think points are important for your audience, but I'd really suggest expending the effort, getting the intrinsic motivation right. And there's a richer model um, that comes from originally from DC and Ryan, they but um, they confounded, they had a couple things separated that really is, is a distinction that wasn't useful. So Matt Richter um, of the Thiagi group crunched it down, just those two cells, but there's a whole suite from apathy to being guilted into doing it to, to kind of realizing you should versus realizing you want to versus being, hey, I love this of my own accord. And I think that last one's the best, but I just think that's really hard to guarantee. But I think we can do the next to the last one reliably because we tap into why they should care. So I think, um, I hope that uh, answers. Um, yeah, I, there's evidence that, you know, points and scores with certain audiences who are highly competitive, but unless you're guaranteed that, that's not good. Otherwise, it can tend to atrophy really quickly. Um, and in fact, uh, somebody who does a lot of gamification talked about how they had to keep fine tuning it and doing it. And it's a lot of work to do it well. And I, um, and I heard a speaker on gamification also say that if you do it wrong, it can undermine what you're doing <laughs> instead of add to it. So mm -hmm. you just really be careful. And we know that rather the intrinsic motivation, not just targeted up drill and kill, but actually building in meaning to the, what you're doing does lead to better outcomes. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're saying don't just add those gamification elements because they, they might make it more engaging. You're saying take a step back, look, try to explore that intrinsic motivation and see why people might care in the first place and address, address those elements we spoke about at the beginning of this session. See, the case you're making is that's going to be more reliable and probably more effective than any individual gamification elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, I believe the evidence tells us that. Yeah. I, it sounds like it. Yeah, all of the all these references you're making to people and and their groups and their companies, I, I'm gonna need to like watch back this replay and and find all of these people and look at their work because it sounds like some good stuff. So thanks for all of those like citations, um, little rabbit holes we can oh, dive yeah. into. Very good. Well, that's that's what happens when you're a nerd like I am about this stuff, and you end up. At, and have done it for decades. You <laughs> end up <laughs> yeah. accumulating a lot of stuff. I haven't even mentioned uh, Luna and Renninger's book on surprise and uh, mm. uh, Barrett's book on emotions and a bunch of stuff that also plays a role into it. Um, yeah, we're going to need... Um, I love it. Okay, so can you mention his book title again? Yeah. Oh, can, my book title, Nick? Hey. I, can act I actually have a featured action set up to share this but okay but i also feel like i need to read every one of your books now also because yeah i had some really good <laughs> good takeaways from this one um following along with your linkedin post isn't going to be enough anymore <laughs> <laughs> um jesse asked about novelty um and yeah the the thing to me about novelty is peppering it through so it doesn't have to be novel all the time. If you're giving them a challenge, that's enough engagement, but then you relax. But I think, you know, if, in a, for instance, in a branching scenario, if there's an unlikely branch, toss a little bit of idiosyncrasy in there. Um, and uh, so in a, 
the workplace of the future demo I did with Learnovators, trying to say how do you, what could you do if you try to apply these principles under real world constraints. There's a character who's taught, you know, who's her boss is trying to talk to her about, you know, her behavior and, and do the right sorts of things. And she's talking about how she's excited about the projects she's worked on. And so one of them is the congressional nullifier, which doesn't exist, but sometimes it would sound like a really good idea. You know, just odd little bits tossed in here to they go, oh, you know, it's not dry and boring. They can have a little sense of humor, a little hmm, bit of yeah. uh, twist of evidence. Um, and the reason I earlier responding to, to Jesse, your comment about background stories, there are also background stories for your characters. Um, a guy wrote a book about creating emotion in games. It's on my shelf, but I don't remember his name right now. Um, but in it, he said, don't just have stereotypical characters. Write a little bit of backstory for them, each of them. Even, you know, you're the, the difficult boss, the difficult employee, the, the difficult customer, whatever. Give them a little backstory. It won't all manifest in the dialogue you see or how they do it, but it gives them a little depth. Have a reason why they're that way that may not actually, and it doesn't have to be a lot of extra work. But it helps create characters that are more interesting and it shows up in subtle ways. But I think it's um, just a, a heuristic that I think is valuable to keep in mind. Yeah, that sounds like a great suggestion, especially because I know a lot of us do build these like character rich kind of learning experiences. Instead of just writing dialogue out of nowhere, I could say it would be really helpful to kind of have like at least a sheet of like, this is where this person's coming from, or maybe even a paragraph of backstory. You could see that helping as well. Yeah. You bring up a, an interesting point that, you know, I mentioned you can't always do it, you know, have a whole team throughout the entire thing, but there are very unique skill sets that too often people can say, oh, I can write prose, I can therefore write dialogue. That's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Dialogue writing is very different. Um, good dialogue, uh, because instructional designers have been trained to be expository with lots of complete sentences and that actually turns out to be wrong uh, for reasons that have to do with um, uh, the way we actually process information. It turns out white space and incomplete sentences and phrases we can process sometimes easier. But dialogue in particular can be very telegraphic, believable dialogue. Let the learner have to make the inference, but their context will provide enough guidance so you don't have to have the character state everything. Make it sound like more natural dialogue and you know, uh, this is uh, so now, by the way, Devlin, I have an important um, assignment for all your uh, viewers and, and uh, students. Perfect. You're going to have to do more work. You're going to have to watch more, read more novels, watch more movies, play more games, go to more amusement parks. This is a big ask. But you're going to go there with a slightly critical eye, say, what makes this work? Look at the dialogue in movies and in com even comic strips. Uh, look at the dialogue, look at um, the the experience. I love how Disney is blind when you're waiting on the long line to get on a ride. They're themed all the way along, so there's something to keep your attention even while you're going through the boring parts. That's, um, you know, Imagineering is their technical term for it. So. You will, the, the more you spend the effort to understand what makes these interesting, the better you will be able to apply them to your own work. So please have more fun as an important part of creating more fun for others. <laughs> yeah, Jesse says, my dog ate my homework. Oh wait, the homework is playing games and watching movies. I'm in. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. And then, and then Christy just suggested reading fiction really helps um, with writing better dialogue and watching movies and maybe I don't know. I don't know if we can make the same case for for going to Disney. Maybe. <laughs> Did you watch the dialogue of the characters as they walk by? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, but they have to be in character. Yeah. You, uh, you know, they are not. Um, Disney tells them you are not employees. You are cast members. Everybody there, and speaks appropriately. It's yeah. You, know, you can rail against some of Disney's. You know, Walt had a little bit of a sort of. Uh, old view of the world, shall we say. But it's, you know, if you go there with the right mindset, to me, it's a lot more fun than Las Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas, I, I 
have to go there a lot, much to my dismay. But the only way I could tolerate is to cynically evaluate how good they are at separating people from their money and all the tics, tips and tricks they use. Mm. There's lessons there, not necessarily good ones, but <laughs> there are lessons there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I guess we should leave it with that um, grueling homework assignment. <laughs> but be more intentional <laughs> consumers of entertainment, it seems like what the suggestion is. Yeah, and um, yeah, think about how what we're consuming is effective at what it's doing. So I'm sure a lot of us do that already, maybe unconsciously or subconsciously, but it's, it's good mm -hmm. bringing conscious awareness to that. If we have time, I'd like to address Gabriella's question. I think that's a big issue is, you know, how do you do this across cultures, across geographic regions? Um, it is a challenge. One of the, and this is particularly true for humor, by the way, but th there is something, there is a common culture. That's the office culture, the workplace culture. There may be nuances around it, but if you can tap into things that are specific to the workplace, something else, we way underuse comics and graphic novel formats, and yet they are a literacy in pretty much every culture that you're liable to deal with. So, and they're particularly lightweight for, you know, bandwidth concerns, and they're much easier to change than video and audio. Um, and uh, they're really great for showing the underlying thinking, which is a really important aspect. Thought bubbles are wonderful. And all you need for thought and speech bubbles, all you need is to add one and a half times the amount of space you need for English and you can accommodate even German, wow. which <laughs> and my mom was German and she used to say, those Germans, they just put words together. Um, and, uh, um, so I think there it is challenging, but tapping into what is shared in the cultures across your organization, across these global regions, gives you a handle that I think can help uh, address this. The concerns are liable to be similar, even though the nuances are different. Yeah, that's a good at least that's the best response I've heard yet. Yeah. <laughs> Good suggestion. Okay, well, let's end it with that then. And uh, you all have the link to Clark's book if you want to dive into that. Again, I got you can start reading it like instantly um, on in an ebook format. That's what I did, like eleven bucks. <laughs> um, mm. Promise you'll get more than eleven dollars worth of takeaways from that. And then if you want to, I mean, Clark does way more than this single book. So if you want to stay stay tuned with what what he's up to, uh, you can connect with him on LinkedIn and you are you seem to be quite active on there as well so i know that will be a good way to follow along i'll share the link to your linkedin as well in case anyone here isn't already connected if you're watching this on youtube i'll share mm -hmm. all these links in the description oh but you have the quinnovator handle on you on linkedin very nice <laughs> yeah all right let's get some applause i'm just putting my chat. my site and uh blog into the post as well Quinnovation.com is the site and thoughts that end up in books and presentations and things tend to show up on my blog first. Okay, so, perfect. Um, learn if less. If you need help sleeping at night, it's a great place to go. Great. Learnless.com <laughs> for some uh, late night learning reading if needed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Put you right to sleep. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, had some great takeaways from the book and from this session, and we will be following along on LinkedIn. So talk to you soon. And thank you everyone for coming and asking the good questions. Bye-bye, everyone. Indeed. Thanks.